Well, good morning, church. As we still have a few more people coming in, would you just open this morning in prayer with me together? Father, as a body, we just come to you this morning humble, humble that we can, can come into your midst, sing worship to you, and open the scriptures together, Father. I just stand in awe of who you are. And as I think in light of who we are, the fact that you love us and you pursue us and you desire us leaves me in all the more I think about it every day, Father. Father, as we come together this morning, help us to come in expectation. Not, not just to come in hope that we're going to see the Spirit move, but to come in expectation that right now, where two or three are gathered, you are right here in our midst. You want to move. You want to move in our midst. You want to move in our lives. You, we want to see a spirit do a work, not just in ourselves, but in this place. So, Father, this morning, I just pray that you would open up eyes, open up hearts to the truths of the scriptures as we open them together. As we sing praises to you, allow us to take the focus off of ourselves. Let's take the focus off of us and put the focus on who you are alone, what you've done for us, God. Father, right now, I just pray that hearts would be in tune with you, that this wouldn't be a time for us to feel like this is the only time we're in the Lord's presence, but this would be a springboard to walk every single moment of our lives in the Lord's presence. Thank you that you're here right now. Thank you that you move. Lord, just be with us as we gather together this morning as your body. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, we're thrilled this morning to have the Gideons here with us. Evan, I'll have you come up on stage with me here. Uh, I'm thrilled this morning to, to have Evan Gibbs here with us to just share a, an update on what's going on in the ministry of the Gideons. I'm sure, as it's been for everyone, it's probably been an interesting few months, the last few months for the Gideons. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a, a ministry I care deeply for. I've attended several events with Vic Britton with the, with the Gideons and just gotten updates on their ministry. And uh, I'll tell you what, any, any ministry that seeks to get the Bible in as many hands as possible sounds pretty darn important to me. So <laughs> I'm really excited to get an update from Evan this morning. Evan, I'll, uh, I'll leave it to you. I was on the FBI's most wanted list. That's the testimony of Mary Kate Beery, a safe cracker and a bank robber. Her and her husband were notorious thieves. Finally, she was arrested and placed in a, a jail in Illinois. And the only time that she could get out of the jail was on Sunday to go to a service like this, sponsored by the Gideons. And there's where she received her first Bible. Mary Kay took that Bible back to her cell and immediately shoved it underneath her mattress and there it stayed for a while. But one evening, she took the Bible out and started leafing through it like we do sometimes. And she came to the book of Ezekiel. Testimony of Ezekiel? Yes. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27 says, And I am the Lord speaking, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you, uh, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put it, my spirit within you and cause you to work, walk in my statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. Quietly, she said on her floor that evening, she asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into her heart and surrendered her life to him. God had saved her. Mary Kay felt the problems of prisoners and particularly their loneliness. And she was blessed that God had used her after she got out of jail as an instrument to belong to begin the Angel Tree Ministry. Some of us old folks might remember that. And then she joined forces with prison ministries that was led by Chuck Colson. I had the privilege of meeting Mary Kay at, a, at a, one of our conventions, a little short lady, uh, humorous, full of joy, but she had a terrible, terrible life. And if you ever see her book around in bookstores, uh, pick it up and read it. It's very interesting. God just loved her to death. Well, good morning. <clears throat> On behalf of the Gideons International, I thank you so much for allowing me to have a few moments of your time this morning. And I want to thank you especially for your prayers in the past and your financial support. It's very important to us, and we thank you 
so much for it. <coughs> Isaiah 55, 11 fulfills God's word, uh, and his word does not return to him void, as men, women, boys, and girls uh, come to Christ by reading the scriptures placed by the Gideons. <coughs> Where would you be this morning if it wasn't for the word of God? Who would you be with? And what would you be doing? Do you, would, would you know, would you have the hope that you now have for eternal life? And would you have the peace that only God can give within your hearts? Folks, there are millions and millions of people in our nation and around the world that have no knowledge of God's love. But you and I, through the Giddings International, uh, have the opportunity to reach out to these dying folks. Matthew 26, 19a says, Go therefore and make disciples amongst all the nations. That was, that's what makes the Gideons so unique. More than 171,000 Gideons now, and 96 auxiliary around the world take the word of God uh, <clears throat> to a little over 200 countries, uh, territories, and possessions. The association has shared on the average of 85 million Bible distri distri distribution, excuse me, uh, over the past seven years. <clears throat> we are scheduled to go to the Ukraine in September of the 12th to the 19th to make it what we call a scripture blitz where men and women from around the world will focus on a country to go and distribute God's word <clears throat> to thousands of people. This past January, the Gideons from around the world along with 69 local Gideons and, and auxiliary met in the Philippines for a Bible distribution. 649,320 Bibles were distributed in a two-week period. The following a distribution to the fifth and sixth graders at a school, a Gideon offered a security guard a copy of God's word and began to share Jesus with him. He said he was eagerly to accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. So it wasn't only the children in the school but it was also the janitor. God continues to work in the heart of the people throughout mainland China. And during your prayer time, please, please remember these Christians. They are being totally, highly prosecuted. Their churches have been burnt down. And now they're seeking out the, the home churches and uh, trying to do away with them. They want no part of Christianity. <clears throat> but... Um, it also says, statistically-wise, that about 100,000 Chinese come to know the Lord daily. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh my goodness, that's 100,000? But I just don't think that we can wrap around our minds that there are billions of people in the land of China. So, mm -hmm. despite all the, the persecution of one eye, God still is working in China. Mm -hmm. And the Guineans International have been able to distribute over 4 million copies of God's Word in 14 different provinces since 2011. Locally, the Gideons uh, will be hoping to distribute Bible with the virus. Of course, it has shut down all our fairs and all these things. But I know that, uh, and I don't know, probably the, the Quarryville Fair, I'm sure, will not go because the governor's going to let it happen. Uh, but they usually distribute around 500 Bibles each year. And they also have the opportunity to go to area Amish schools. And there they distribute approximately 200 Bibles each year. I want to tell you an experience, though, that I had distributed Bibles a year ago last August. That things were still going well. And a group of camps up around <coughs> Hershey went to the Hershey Milton School, their church, uh, their church uh, service. And uh, there was probably uh, 10 of us there. My wife and I was the first in line, had our boxes of Bibles on the ground, and they opened the doors, and out come these kids. We distributed totally 970 Bibles that, that Sunday morning. They had two services, one for the younger kids and one for the high school age. 
Beverly and I handed out 200 of those Bibles within five minutes. That's how fast they just come in fours and fives. You walk down the sidewalk and, and you're handing them out as fast as you can. But this, it, it just lifts my soul. It's just so great to see all these kids. And we trust they wanted them. And we trust that they go back and, and, and read them. And uh, especially in the back of our, all of our little New Testaments, there's the way of salvation that they can read. And uh, we trust that they would do that. <clears throat> this testimony is one of a life changer. It says, I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. Both my parents were heavily involved, heavily in, in drugs and alcohol. But when I was younger, my mom used to take me to church. But then she stopped. After, <clears throat> and uh, my parents soon got divorced. After they divorced, I stayed with my mom, who constantly changed jobs and boyfriends, moving us from home to home. I never felt grounded or secure. I remember being abused and frequently called worthless. I began smoking and drinking at the age of 11, and I continued abusing substance through grade school. Can you imagine that? I was kicked out of high school my sophomore year and left home at the age of 16. I spent the nights anywhere other than my mom's place. I ended up living in some bad places among the worst kinds of people. At a party one night, I shot a full clip of ammunition into a car of someone I thought had stolen from me. I was duly arrested, prosecuted for two counts of attempted murder. Since there I was, at 21 years old, facing 72 years in prison. I had no friends. I had no family, I had no hope. However, there in my jail, in my jail cell, I found a Bible placed by the Gideons. I had never read a Bible before. As I opened it up to the book of Matthews, Matthew, I learned about Jesus and his love. Matthew 5, verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I had never felt comfort, peace, or true love in my life. So I prayed for the first time and asked God to let me taste these things before my life was over. In that moment, he said, I felt the, arm, the Father's arms wrap around me, and his love burned so hot through me, I began to weep from my very soul. I was forever changed in one instant. I vowed to follow God and his love and to give my life to him no matter what the rest of my life would bring. I was incarcerated nine months. During that time, I went to addiction classes, continued my education and got my CD, GED. I waited my sentencing without an attorney. I only had Jesus. By the grace of God, I was sentenced to four years probation and released the very next day. He says, I was a free man. Today, he's a pastor in Colorado with Teen Challenge, and I'm in, in newly married. In just a few short years, my life has been transformed from one, from one of pain and suffering to a life of joy and service to the King. I daily thank God and his unrelenting love to call out my name in that jail cell and speak the truth through his word. Another young man says, I am my, his name is Jared. He said, I was raised in the church all my life. At the age of nine, I gave my life to Christ. When I was new to my faith, things were easier. But as I got older, things changed. I realized my relationship with the Lord was not the priority of my life. During my teenage years, I struggled to find direction. I had recently lost my dad to a short, aggressive battle with cancer. I went to church, but I doubted the truth of God's word. How could, I, how could a good guy take away my dad? So I continued to struggle. Here was a fight for my heart between God and my flesh. I was consumed with anger and bitterness over the loss of my father. In an effort to hold on to him, I went digging through his old stuff. It was there that I found the testament of the Gideon's emblem. I cling to it. 
I clung to it like a lifeline. Soon I began to see testaments in other colors all around my house. It was revealed to me my dad was a Gideon. He shared scriptures with anyone he met and placed God's word in key, uh, key locations of life. He said, I took, my dad's, I took my father's testament with me when I went on walks throughout the property in the country. One of my favorite places became a cave that was underground with an underground spring in it. And there was a ledge attached to that overlooking the water. And I would sit there and talk to God. I began to feel his presence meeting me there. I ended up rededicating my life. He renewed my spirit and gave me new hope. For the first time I had a peace about pass, passing on my dad, a peace that surprised passes all human understanding. I'd never come closer to my father, both earthly and heavenly. I'm thankful my relationship with Christ grows each and every day. Testimonies. Go to, if you want to see more, there's hundreds, hundreds of them on, on, the, on the Gideon website, gideon.org. And under testimonies, you can find more and more and more. Some some are really heart-wrenching, but it's all good because God wins in the end. Right? As you can see, we members and the thicker um, member of the Gideons, you can see that we're getting a little old in age. And the average age of my camp is 65. So I'm here also not to tell you what's going on, but to ask for some help. If some of you are especially retired and you're looking for something to do, the Gideon is a place for you. Uh, after this pandemic gets over with, I'm sure that we'll be out again uh, distributing God's word we haven't been able to. Uh, we are planning <coughs> a uh, description in the United States in Pittsburgh in October. And I noticed another one in Seattle, Washington in October. I don't know how that one is going to work out. It doesn't sound good. But praise to God, he, God uses people in many different ways, and, and who knows, you know, some of those bad boys and girls up there might receive a copy of God's word and change their hearts. But also, if you don't want to join, and I have some brochures out front for being a friend of the Gideons, being a prayer partner with the Gideons, or being a financial help with the, uh, with the Gideons, and you can talk to me later about those. But I would encourage you to take an app card. If you have not taken an app card, this, this particular one uh, has uh, 1,500 different languages of God's word on it. And it's just a, it's an app, and I have a few of those out uh, outside on the table there. And you can talk to me about that if you would like. So I'm asking prayer for our ministry, that God will continue to use his glory. Would you be willing uh, also to help us financially? And I'm not here asking for your tithe money or your missionary money. Perhaps you are not prepared today uh, to donate, but in your bulletin this morning, if you would open it up, you'll see that there is an envelope. And any time you get a little extra cash and you think about us and you like to make a donation, you can do that through the envelope in the bulletin. All right, uh, I want to thank you, Pastor, for giving me some, some time this morning to speak with you and congregation. I thank you so much for your attention. May the Lord bless you all. As Patrick and Anna come, can we just pray for the ministry of the Gideons now? Father, we just thank you for such a large group of men who want nothing more than to see the Bible get into as many hands as possible. So that as many, pe as, as many people as possible around this world can hear the good news of a Savior who loves them, who died for them, and right now whose desire is for them and he wants to bring them home. He's not, he's not some far off Savior. He's waiting right behind them with open arms. And I thank you that the Bible is the story that they can turn around at any time and come home to him. Father, we just again pray for the ministry of the Gideons. We lift them up to you. We thank you for the passion in their hearts to see the Bible taken into the world so that disciples can be made and people can hear the good news. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother. 
Good morning, Corrine Church. It's good to see you this morning. Let's all stand up together. In Isaiah 55, 6, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. So this morning we sing our only King forever. God in firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken. We trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. We trust the name. We trust. Fill us with X. 
expectation this morning, God. In your name I pray. Amen.
to give our minds rest, to give our souls rest. Remember the scripture says your yoke is, is not burdensome, it's light. And Lord, I thank you for that. You just desire to know us and to have relationship with us, Lord. There's no other one like you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you want to know us. You want to go deeper with us. Deep calls to deep, God. All your waves crash over me. Lead us, Lord, as we're still before you, as we reflect upon you. And yes, we will sing to you. Yes, we will lift up praise to you this morning, God. In your name I pray. One who deserves all, deserves all praise and glory. Let's all say amen.
for us one more time. Just yes, I will. softly on the, on the piano. thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I take comfort in that verse. Because I'm reminded we don't have to try so hard, right? We can just show up and expect Him to work and expect Him to move. And Lord, it's what you do this morning. And Lord, we're trusting you. We're resting in you. And Lord, you're able to work miracles. You're able to turn things around, God. And I'm thankful for that today, God. I'm thankful that we're two or three are gathered there. You are in the very midst. Thank you for this family, God. to worship a God who deserves it. If you have your Bibles, 
Go ahead and turn with me this morning to Galatians chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be pressing on in our chapter by chapter series on the book of Galatians. And this morning, honestly, as we're coming to chapter 3, we're coming to a chapter that we could have looked at for weeks alone. You know, we're spending six weeks looking at the book of Galatians, looking at a chapter each week. We could spend six or more weeks in chapter three alone. There, there's so much here, but I challenged myself this week to try and focus in on three specific verses. I'm going to read through the whole chapter this morning, but as we read, I'm going to call your attention to three specific verses that are kind of going to be the center of what I'm going to focus on this morning. And as, you know, even though we're just going to really lock in on those verses, if, if we read through chapter 3 and something sticks out to you, if the Spirit moves in some way, if a verse, you know, just sticks off a page to you, I, I, I implore you to go home later today and, and dig into it and, and seek what the Spirit has for you there. But we're going to look at Galatians chapter 3 this morning. Paul writes this to the churches in Galatia. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. This is verse 2 and 3 is one of the first verses. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, in the, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God will justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all three things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. I'll give a human example, brothers. Even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring who is Christ, this is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Verse 21 is our second verse. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed come through the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in, Christ, in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were, as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And verse 28 and 29 are our third verses this morning. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs 
according to promise. Church, you may have been thinking it while we were reading it. There is a lot here. And there's a lot in chapter 3 that could easily take us into some of Paul's other letters. There's a lot in chapter 3 that's going to take us back to the Old Testament. But chapter 3, more than anything, I believe, we see Paul really laying it all on the line. We see in, verse, in chapter 1 and 2 an initial frustration with the Galatians' ease of going back to a works-based salvation, a salvation that frankly doesn't exist. But chapter 3, we can almost feel this frustration boiling over. Look at the, the opening three words of chapter 3. Oh, foolish Galatians. And the Greek word he uses there that we translate to foolish doesn't mean someone who is unaware or someone who's ignorant. This Greek word foolish means you have the knowledge, but you are not using it. Wisdom we know to be knowledge that is applied to our lives. He's saying you are the, the polar opposite of wise right now. You have the knowledge. Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified by Paul when he came to Galatia. You have the knowledge of what happened to Jesus, and you don't apply it. You have the knowledge, yet you cast it aside, and you choose to put a burden back on your shoulders. This is what he's saying to us. You're putting a burden back on your shoulders that you could never possibly carry. It's a burden that many of us still carry today, as we talked about last week. Today we'll hear it talked about as legalism. And the day of the Galatians, the big issue, the biggest thing he's writing to them for was the issue of, of circumcision. There were other things along with that coming into play. Dietary laws, social customs, that the early church was being pressured by Jewish believers to adopt. Now, as I said last week, it's their way of saying without saying, listen, Jesus is great, but he's not enough. You need to follow these customs too. But the biggest divider at this point by far, the biggest Thing that was driving a wedge between Jewish believers and the Gentile believers that made up the early church was the custom of circumcision. You see, the Jewish believers were still looking very closely at their physical forefather, Abraham. They were seeing the covenant that God made with Abraham. The covenant we see began in Genesis 17, and it's a good covenant. When God comes to Abraham and says, I want to be Lord among my people. And as time goes by, we see different covenants being established from God to the Jewish people. The Abrahamic covenant is not even the first. We see the, the Noah, Noahic covenant first, that God will never again flood the world. Some of us in Lancaster County may have been doubting that earlier this week, but it, it, it stands true that God will never again flood the world. We see a, he comes to Abraham and brings the covenant of circumcision. We see him come to Moses and bring the covenant that would bring the law. And then the Davidic covenant we see in 2 Samuel. Church, the, the fact of the matter is all of these covenants, while they're good in their own right, just like the law, they're pointing us to something, to someone. Every single one of these covenants in their own way will eventually point us to the Messiah, will point us to Jesus. The Davidic covenant being the most loud in that regard and saying a descendant from the family of David will rule on the throne of God over the people of God. We know ultimately this is Jesus. He is the perfect fulfillment of not just the law, but of all of these covenants. And he's the fulfillment of the final covenant spoken about in Jeremiah 31, the new covenant. And we know that that was inaugurated on the night as he sat with his disciples and he broke bread and he poured wine. And from that moment on, the new covenant was inaugurated in the person of Jesus. That's the first thing I want us to see this morning in light of this question that Paul is posing to the Galatian church in verse 2. Again, verse 2. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Jesus was the fulfillment of the law he was the fulfillment of the prior covenants. The Garden of Eden is going to give us a glimpse into what it's like if the Galatian church had gotten their way. We're going to call it a covenant of works. If the Galatians church had gotten what, gotten what they wanted, a covenant of works where they could work their way back to God, the Garden of Eden is time and time again the picture of what happens when we're given that. God said, Adam, tend this garden. You can eat from literally any tree you want to except for that one. And he beelines for that one. 
he, he and Eve. When a man is left to his own strength, his own devices, his own works, the Garden of Eden will show us that time and time again, we fail. And in the failure of Adam, in the failure of a covenant with, of works, comes instead the only covenant that's going to work, a covenant of grace, the new covenant. And that is what Paul is begging them to see here when he asks this question in verse 2. He says, don't you remember the first time the Spirit moved among you? Paul, Paul would have been there. Paul took the gospel into Galatia. He would have been there and experienced it with them as the, the Holy Spirit moved in through the church of Galatia for the first time. He says, don't you remember when the Spirit came and moved in your midst for the first time? Do you really think that the Spirit came and moved in your midst because of the works that you did? Do you really think that the Spirit came because you are good? No, you saw the Spirit of God move not because you're good, not because your works are good. You saw the Spirit of God move because He is good. And that day in your lives, Paul says, He began a work in you that you are now trying to uproot so that you can carry it with your own strength. I love the contrast of verse 3 to what we see in the letter to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 6. We're going to see, we see in the contrast of those two verses the absolute hopelessness that comes in when we choose to lean on our own strength and on our own works. Galatians 3, 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh, by their works? Philippians 1, 6. I am sure of this, Paul writes, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It's hard because the Galatians, they're not looking at a bad example when they look at Abraham. On the contrary, they're looking at an amazing example. But their issue is, like we so often do as humans, they were choosing not to look at the whole picture. They were choosing to look at, the, at chapter 17 of Genesis where we see circumcision, the covenant established with Abraham. But we see something big happening in Abraham's life years prior to this in Genesis 15. Turn with me if you will. I want to read Genesis chapter 15, just verses 1 through 6. The Lord coming to Abraham. We know that Abraham at this point, still named Abram, Covenant has not been enacted yet, and still at this point waiting for a true heir. Genesis 15, 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very, shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to Abraham, Abram, This shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to them, So shall your offspring be. And verse 6 is the, the thing I want us to see here. And Abram believed the Lord, and God counted it to him as righteousness. Years before the covenant of circumcision, years before Abram and his people were given an outward sign of an inward covenant with God, we're told that Abraham believed God. He believed when the Lord came to him and said, no, I will give you an heir, even in your old age. And Abraham's belief was counted to him as righteousness. His faith in God's word was counted to him as righteousness. Church, Jesus is the result of Abraham's faith here in Genesis 15. Abraham begins to worry about an heir. God says, Abraham, even in your old age, not only will I give you an heir, look at the stars. If you can number them, I will make your future as such. That will be the number of offspring that come from you. Abraham in his old age, I, I think, was beginning to slip into a mode that says, I need to act. I, if I'm going to have an heir, I need to act. I need to get myself an heir. I need to take matters into my own hands, but he doesn't. It would have been really easy to, but he doesn't. 
He believes God when he says, you will have an heir. And because of his faith to believe God, generations later, in his same line, born of this same descendancy, in Bethlehem, a baby boy will be born. Because of Abraham's faith to believe God, that lineage would lead to Jesus. We can note as well that not only was this years ahead of the covenant of circumcision, Paul will tell us himself here in Galatians chapter 3, it is 430 years before the law is even given to Moses. And even still, without the law, without this thing that the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Jewish believers had clung so tightly to for so many years, 430 years before it came into existence, we're still told Abraham was counted righteous because of his belief in the word of God, the promise of an heir. That heir comes, time begins to pass, and in time, four centuries later, we see a new covenant forged between God and his people, the Mosaic Covenant. A covenant of law, that if they will follow his law, they will be his people and he will be their God. The law is given by God, and as I've said before, it is holy in and of itself because it comes from God. The law gives us a window into the character of God. It shows us who he is. And yet time and time again in the Old Testament, we see strife, we see exile, we see failure. The laws we've heard so many times, it comes in, the law comes in, it comes down the mountain with Moses. And for the first time, I believe, these, the Jewish people are seeing just how much their nature is separating them from God. They see the gap that separates them from a God that is holy. And they, they're made aware of it for the first time. But that's the problem with the law. It makes them aware of it and it leaves them there. The law comes in and says, here is the gap. I can't do anything to get you across it. Paul even says here in Galatians 3.10, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. The law makes us fully aware of our separation. It makes us aware of our depravity, and it leaves us right there. And it says, Abide by what I say. And the Old Testament, if we're being frank with ourselves, the Old Testament is quite literally the story of a people who tried time and time again to abide, and every single time they failed. Look with me at verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. As I said just last week, the law in and of itself is not bad. It is not sinful. I believe that this day and age especially, there's this, we read the law with this mindset that in and of itself is bad. The law in and of itself is holy. It doesn't run counter to what God promises, as Paul says here. The law is there really to show us how great that chasm is that lays between us and the goodness of God. And the problem with the law that Paul is exploring here is that the law cannot give strength to those who desire to walk by it. It just can't. It can say, the law can come and say, walk in these good works. It can't give us the strength to do so. And as Paul says, if the law could do that, if it could give strength to walk in and of it, if it could be itself life-giving, if my works could give me new life, then the law alone could have brought righteousness. Abraham would not have needed to believe God because he could go out and by his own works, he could find himself an heir. But the law can't do that. It can't give life. The law states the command. It tells us to keep it. And it lays out the consequences if we don't. Paul says in the very next verse that to be made aware of our sin, to be made aware of our depravity, our condition, our separation, is to be imprisoned by it. Sin is being personified for us here as a jailer. 
and we as the jails. We sit in our cells and we say, I can get out any time I want. How many times have we ourselves said a variation of that when we're sitting in our own lives? I can stop any time I want. And time and time again, when we think like that, we find ourselves leaning into our own strength. And as we try to bend those bars out of the way and walk out of that cell, we find that they don't budge when we depend on our own strength. Time and time again, as we walk in sin, we'll, we'll repeat those same things. Then that's the last time I'm never doing that again. And days later, we find ourselves still in the same sin, still imprisoned as we struggle to break free of our own strength. And the truth that I think needs to be spoken here in this church today is that only faith in Christ can break us free from that confinement in sin. The law of Moses can make us fully aware of our predicament in sin, but it cannot give us the freedom that only Jesus can. And it is a freedom that is only given to those who believe. Church, if you this morning are in Christ Jesus, you are no longer confined by your sins and you're no longer defined by your sins. By your faith to believe, just as we see with Abraham in Genesis 15, by your faith to believe in Jesus, you have been called righteous. And I think we need to see we've been called righteous not because we are good, only because he is good. But that is not all that Paul will show us about the life lived in, in Jesus in chapter 3. He ends this chapter with one of the most foundational truths of the New Testament. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. You see, the issue that the Jewish believers were having is they were looking at Abraham as their forefather and their forefather only through blood. What Paul is now saying is through faith, because Gentiles are being counted as righteous through faith, the Gentiles are now being grafted in. We see a whole chapter about this in the book of Romans. Gentiles being grafted into the family tree, the lineage of Abraham. Abraham is not only the Jewish heir through blood, he is the forefather of your Gentile brothers and sisters according to promise, Paul says. Jesus calls his church to unity. That's not something the early church had. That's what we see here in Galatians 3. That's what we're gonna, what we're gonna see next month when we hop back into Acts and Acts 15. The early church struggled so much with unity. Jewish believers, Gentile believers, Old Testament customs, New Testament faith. We see them butting heads time and time again because so many in the early church wanted to put that dividing line in the sand and say, we're on this side and you're on that side. We're the Jewish believers, the heirs of Abraham. You are just Gentile believers and you have to follow our customs. We're already seeing that so early in the church's life that the potential to split was, was, was huge. And something based on nothing more than the lineage you were born into. Something that no person ever born has any control over whatsoever. And Paul says, listen. And he gives them a truth I know that we still need to hear today. He says... Forget about who you were. Forget about the identity that you used to be so wrapped up in. To be an, an heir of Abraham was something that the Jews took great pride in. And Paul says, forget it. In Christ Jesus, there is no longer Jew nor Greek. If you are in Jesus now, you are only in Jesus. There isn't Gentile believers and Jewish believers. There is only believers. All are heirs to the promise. Paul sees that line that so many had drawn in the sand and he does his best to try and wipe it away here. He says, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are no longer a Jew or Gentile. Your identity is not in if you are a slave or a master. Your, your identity isn't first and foremost if you're male or female. If you are in 
Christ Jesus, you are simply in Christ Jesus. The Lord is still today and has always been calling his church to a place of unity. And church, whether we're aware of it or not, there are still so many today in the church who are drawing those lines in the sand. Lines are being drawn between denominations, between races, between social classes, and lines are most certainly being drawn today between political parties. And church, the Lord laid a truth on my heart this week that, to be honest, was difficult for me to come to grips with, and it's, but it's one I needed to hear, and I think it's one we all need to hear this morning. If we feel that we have more common ground, more in common with an unbeliever who shares our race, our political party, or our social class, rather than a genuine Christian, a genuine brother and sister from another race, political party, or social class, we have drawn a line in the sand that Jesus died on the cross to erase. For all are one in Christ Jesus. Church, I wonder this morning if we could just close this service before we worship with a prayer for unity and cohesion. It, unity has really been the, the big word for me the last year as I focused in on 1 Peter. What the, the Lord is calling his church to, brotherly love, sympathy, humble minds, unity is what the Lord is calling his church to. We see how important it was for Paul to be sure that there were no lines being drawn in the sand that all were one in Christ Jesus. Would you join me with a prayer for that this morning as Patrick and Anna come? Father, as I think this morning about your church, about your body of believers, there was never meant to be division. There was never meant to be this, this separation we so often see. Father, I pray right now for all of us here this morning. Help us to see the lines that we may have drawn in the sand without even realizing it. Help us to see the, the walls that we put up without even realizing it. The separation we build. Father, help us as we think about your church, first and foremost, to always see that your church is called to unity. Father, help Colerain Church to, to walk in that unity. No matter our differences that we can see, Father, help us, help us to see the gospel as the common ground worth standing on together. Father, I pray for the church in general in America right now. Bring that unity back right now in a season where there is division, there's strife, there's so much animosity in our country. I pray that right now the church would be a beacon of unity. Father, as we step out of this building today, help us to be the church in all moments. No matter where we go, no matter what we do, we're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Help us to see everyone we come into contact with, everyone we may speak to every day. Help us to see them as you see them. Worth going to the cross and dying. Father, remind us every day of the simple truth that it's not about us. We are in you. Help us to live every moment in light of that truth, that we are in Christ Jesus. We are no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer male or female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Remind us of that truth, Father. Bring us to a place of unity around the gospel. Pray this all in Jesus' name. So I'm feeling uh, like we should end this service on the song, Take My Life. We were going to do To God Be the Glory, but I'm feeling this chorus says, Here am I, all of me, take my life, it's all for thee. And that's what it's about, isn't it? To keep our eyes focused on Jesus, and he'll lead you, he'll lead me into a lost and dying world. So let's all stand together as we sing Take My Life.
Take 